Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Jane Greer, whose warm beauty reflects her status as Hollywood's reigning queen of film noir in the late 1940s, has a special place in the hearts of film noir fans for the femme fatale she played alongside Robert Mitchum and Kirk Douglas in Out of the Past. The native of Washington, D.C. and former beauty contestant and model caught the eye of Hollywood after appearing in Life magazine. She later signed with RKO after studio head Howard Hughes became smitten with her. She was a calm killer who, at first, appeared to be an angel, with huge brown eyes, fluffy brown hair, and a beautiful glow that made adult men tremble. How was Jane Greer made and almost destroyed by the same man? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Jane Greer, the woman with the Mona Lisa smile. Jane Greer was a bad girl you could fall in love with, who could take on Robert Mitchum and really make him melt, Lasker said. Jane was an American actress most known for playing Kathy Moffat, the femme fatale in the 1947 film Out of the Past. She was born on September 9, 1924 in Washington, D.C. to Betty and Charles Durrell McClellan Greer, Jr., she had a twin brother named Don, and she grew up to be a beautiful young woman who competed in several beauty contests, winning the majority of them. In 1940, when Jane was a 15-year-old girl, she was asked by her party date why she was making such a funny face. When she looked in the mirror, she was shocked to see that the muscles on the left side of her face had become completely slack and paralysed. Diagnosed with Bell's palsy, a rare neurological disorder from which most people did not recover at the time, the aspiring actress had to close her left eye with her hand before going to bed and had to push the left corner of her mouth up into a frozen smile before going to school each day. The painstaking therapy she performed on her face not only stimulated her interest in acting, but almost completely removed the disfigurement though one wonders if it may have contributed to the patented look that made Jane Greer one of the most intriguing performers of her day. Despite the fact that facial exercises helped her overcome her condition, the palsy attack gave her a permanent patented look, earning her the nickname The Woman with the Mona Lisa Smile. Greer began her show business career as a singer, thanks to her lovely voice. She dropped out of high school in her senior year to work as a singer, in the Ralph Hawkins Band for $100 per week. She later became a member of the Enrique Madriguera Orchestra, which had been hired to perform at Washington's Tony Club Del Rio. Greer was performing in big bands before she was out of her teens. She then went on to model for a variety of companies. In 1942, Howard Hughes noticed her and sent her to Hollywood. I'd always wanted to be an actress, and suddenly I knew that learning to control my facial muscles was one of the best assets I could have as a performer. Emotions often must be portrayed from an inner feeling, of course, but I had a double advantage because I was learning to direct my as-yet expressionless feelings, as well as gaining an ability to express emotion by a very conscious manipulation of my muscles, Greer once told an interviewer. After a successful modelling career, she relocated to Hollywood in 1945 and began working as a film actress. She changed her name to Jane the same year. She went on to have a successful career in both film and television. She eventually signed with RKO Studios and worked on several major films for them, including Dick Tracy, Build My Gallows High and They Won't Believe Me. Now let's talk about the achievements of Jane Greer and the man who made her and the man who destroyed her. Beginning in the mid-1940s, the slender, chestnut-haired Washington native appeared in nearly 30 films. As I told earlier, the man who sent Jane Greer to Hollywood was Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes, the eccentric billionaire, could make or break any actress's career on a whim, and he frequently did it as well. When Hughes saw a reproduction of a World War II recruitment poster in Life magazine of the petite, almond-eyed, 18-year-old Betty Jane Greer posing in a smart new WAC uniform, he told one of his acolytes to find this girl as soon as possible and sign her up. 
Hughes whisked Jane Greer from Washington, D.C., where she was born, to Los Angeles, and despite becoming one of the leading actresses in film noir, she had to wait two years to appear on screen. Her mother, a children's book author, worked in the U.S. War Department's Public Information Office and landed her daughter the job of modelling the uniform. Betty Jane's mother accompanied her to Los Angeles when she was a young girl. Despite this, Hughes was able to keep Greer under house arrest for five months. Hughes was obsessed with me, she said many years later, but at first it seemed as if he were offering me a superb career opportunity. Her career was both made and destroyed by Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was an inventor, director, businessman, pilot, and a dozen other things rolled into one eccentric individual. While he was undeniably a force to be reckoned with, he was also known for being a huge creep who blackmailed young women and designed unethical money-grabbing contracts to control their lives and careers, and no one knew that side of Hughes more than Jane Greer, if she'd known it. Greer might have become the most famous film noir starlet if she hadn't met Hughes. When Greer signed her contract, this ridiculously wealthy tycoon and filmmaker was obligated to lasso her under a personal contract. Hughes informed her that he didn't want her to marry, and even more shockingly, he didn't want her to act. She wasn't going to sit back and take that kind of treatment, and she quickly snapped back at Hughes with a string of obscenities. As soon as she was able to avoid Hughes and his spies, Greer met Rudy Valley, the former crooner turned comic supporting actor, and they married a few weeks later. Hughes became enraged and threatened to drop her unless she divorced Valley. He had signed her to a seven year contract but had been unable to find her any roles. She was frustrated and sued Howard for breach of contract. To avoid controversy and having his name dragged through the mud, the super jealous and spiteful multimillionaire was forced to let Greer buy out her contract for the sum of $7,500, and that certainly was a lot of money for someone in the 1940s who had been unemployed for the better part of her adult life. Hughes allowed Greer to pay him back in weekly instalments of $25, that way he was still able to financially control her. It took Greer six years to pay back, so he was in full control, but even that amount of control wasn't enough for Howard. Greer was able to find a new studio to act for, and it was relatively a lot quicker. The studio name was RKO, and her movie career was finally getting back on track, until she discovered the studio had been sold to none other than Howard Hughes. Not long after he bought the studio, Hughes summoned Greer to his office, and informed her that he would no longer be using her, and that, because she was under an exclusive contract with RKO, she would be unable to work for anyone else. Greer raised objections and told Hughes that he was effectively ruining her film career, to which Hughes reportedly replied, Yes, that's right. He knew exactly what he was doing, and it looked fairly clear that he was acting out of sheer spite. Hughes, on the other hand, persisted in putting pressure on Greer, and as a result her marriage suffered. Greer moved in with Hughes as his lover soon after her divorce from Valley in 1944. RKO initially cast her as a showgirl in three films, under her real name, Betty Jane Greer. Jane Greer played femme fatale Kathy Moffat in Jack Tournier's film noir Out of the Past in 1947. While the film went on to become one of the greatest of all noir films, the actress received a lot of praise for her performance. The film grossed $90,000 at the box office. Greer became so identified with bad girl parts that the writers of The Company She Keeps changed her role to suit her film persona. During filming, Jane Greer told an interviewer, I had always played a dance hall tramp or a gun moll or something, and this was my first part as a sweet young thing. I was very happy about it. But the writers soon fixed that. They switched me from a sister-in-law to a designing sweetheart. Instead of appealing to her screen brother-in-law's better nature, I was to shake him down for $2,000. Greer's last RKO film was The Company She Keeps. She was of a deceitful ex-con in it, who made a play for her parole officer's boyfriend, Elizabeth Scott. In one scene, the baby in her arms is played by Jeff Bridges, who is making his film debut. She made her film debut in 1951 with the comedy You're in the Navy Now. 
The film, directed by Henry Hathaway, focused on the United States Navy during the early months of World War II. She then appeared in The Prisoner of Zender alongside Stuart Granger, James Mason and Deborah Carr. The film was released in 1952 and was a box office success in France. That year Greer played a mother of two lost kids in Joseph H. Lewis's adventure film Desperate Search. In 1953 she appeared in the musical comedy Down Among the Sheltering Palms. In the United States, the film grossed $1 million against a budget of $1.4 million. Three years later, in the thriller adventure Run for the Sun, the actress was cast as Catherine Connors, an editorial employee of Sight magazine. She then appeared in Man of a Thousand Faces, a 1957 film about the life of silent film actor Lon Chaney. The screenwriters of the film were nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. Her on-screen character was not matched by her countenance in person. Said daughter-in-law Anne Willie Lasker, she was just gracious and sweet. She had this image on film that she wasn't in life. In the 1960s she played Marion Spicer in the drama film Where Love Has Gone and Agnes Carroll in the musical Billy. Greer also appeared as a guest star on the TV shows Stagecoach West, Thriller and Burke's Law during the decade. She appeared in the crime film The Outfit, a TV film titled A Christmas for Boomer, and the sitcom Columbo during the 1970s. The talented actress advanced her career beginning in the 1980s with a recurring role in Falcon Crest. Greer was fascinated to return to noir in a small role in Against All Odds, director Taylor Hackford's 1984 film based on Out of the Past, starring Jeff Bridges and Rachel Ward. Gary Arnold, a Washington Post critic, dismissed Hackford's work but praised Greer for displaying a potentially sinister aura of refinement and fragility. She played as the mother of the main character of the movie. She went on to star in David Lynch's TV show Twin Peaks. In 1986 she starred as Ruth Chadwick in Just Between Friends, a drama about two women whose friendship is put to the test by tragedy. She appeared as a guest on two episodes of The Law and Harry McGraw and Saturday Night Live in 1987. Greer then appeared in a few episodes of Twin Peaks Season 2. According to San Francisco Examiner critic Bob Stevens in a 1997 essay on the film's endurance, Greer helped distinguish the work with a style that remained modern. Stevens wrote to Greer, isn't frivolous like a lot of noir demigoddesses. Her sexiness comes from cunning, and she never relies on the flirtatious self-parody of such actresses as Lauren Bacall and Martha Vickers. Greer has received increasing recognition since film studies department sprouted up in the 1970s and re-evaluated the noir style, which went largely unnoticed in its day, despite not being as prolific as some of her peers. Greer's trademark, according to Janine Bassinger, Chair of the Film Studies Department at Wesleyan University and an expert on women in film, was blending an innocent veneer with undercurrents of raw villainy. The terrifying thing of Jane Greer is that she seems sweet. Bassinger said she is someone you could be set up with on a blind date. Jane Greer's life is a clear example of how people try to use or take control of your life, but you should always be cautious of such lunatics as they always show you a fool's paradise and you never get to know their real intentions. We also saw that no matter how many hardships came and tried to detract Greer from her goal in life, that was to become an actress, she never quit and followed her heart till the very end. She may have had a downfall in her career, but she never gave up. Same as Jane Greer, we should also never back down from our goals in life and prioritise them above every other thing. Keeping in mind the mistakes that Jane made and learning how to overcome them, we can live a life without any regret. The actress married lawyer businessman Edward Lasker on August 20th, 1947 and had three sons with him, Alex, Lawrence and Stephen. Greer and Lasker split up in 1967. She spent her later years with her partner Frank London, with whom she lived until his death in 2001, six months before her own cancer-related death. Greer is stayed alive by her twin brother, her three sons, Alex, Lawrence and Steve, as well as two grandchildren, whereas Frank London, who was her common-law husband, 
died in January. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. The lives of actresses and women in general were dominated by powerful men during the golden age of Hollywood in many cases, but there were also outstanding women who made it big at the time. Watch this video about Alma Reville, the woman who invented Alfred Hitchcock.